Hello, one all! This is my review of Doc Stone, Chapter 179, Bonds and the High Wire. And the big question in this chapter is can we trust Yoga? Can the Kingdom of Science trust him? And a lot of people online seem to interpret the fact that, you know, didn't throw Kohaku off a cliff as proof that Yoga has become a nice person. He's a good guy, and we can become fans of his moving forward. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, yeah, he could have killed Kohaku and then everyone else around him. Then what was his plan? What would he have done after that? There's no place nearby for Stanley to, you know, land the plane and come pick them up, and even if there was, I think Stanley would immediately, you know, shoot Hyoga, thinking that he was still part of the Kingdom of Science, not working with Zeno, so that would make a whole lot of sense for him. It would make a lot more sense, though, if he ends up betraying them when they actually get to the Petrication Beam, at that point where he can actually get a weapon that he can use, you know, petrify everyone else around them, and then maybe at that point they'll find a way to contact Stanley, turn things around, and join Zeno's Kingdom of Science. But even that seems kind of unlikely to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I have no problem imagining Hyoga actually made that kind of deal with Zeno, but why would he go through with it? I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, the world that Senku was planning on building is certainly not the one that Zeno imagined, not the one he dreamed of, not the one he hoped for, but Senku is a reasonably straight shooter. If he says he'll do something, he'll do it, and he has a weird amount of trust in Hyoga. I still, I will never forget that scene when Hyoga first wakes up, when, he, when he's first depetrified on the ship, and he tells Senku, dodge left, he does, and... Oh, that's such an amazing shot. That's such an amazing shot. Such an amazing sign of loyalty that Senku has with Hyoga, even though, you know, they were enemies before. Meanwhile, Zeno attempted to murder Senku, his own student that he actually cares a great deal for. So, what evidence does Hyoga have that Zeno won't do the same thing and just have him killed as soon as he becomes as soon as he becomes a mild inconvenience? It makes way more sense for Yoga to stick around with Senku and the gang right now. Maybe lure Zeno on, make him think they have a deal so he can betray him down the road, but I just really can't imagine him, you know, betraying Senku and switching to Zeno's side. It just doesn't seem like a good idea on his part. Anyway, the rest of the chapter. So we open up with Kohaku seeming to defy all the laws of physics as she jumps on a tire and manages to fly like 30 feet through the air. Yeah, okay, that was interesting, very, very interesting. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, Kohaku is freaking insanely strong and powerful, so that's not too much of a surprise, but I just kind of wish we'd seen, you know, the math, the calculations, the physics behind this, explaining exactly how she managed to do this without, you know, falling into the vast cavern below or breaking her legs when she landed. I'm just very curious about that. And then they use the uh, ropeway as a phone, which I just absolutely freaking love. I mean, it's such a... Oh, such a great, just little invention. On the other hand, it also does a good job of showing the fact that if Yoga and Zeno had talked on the way uh, between the two points, no one on either side would have been able to hear them. No one would have been able to make out the conversation. And with Yoga's mask, you wouldn't even be able to see his lips moving. So, very, very interesting there. And then we actually see the ropeway, and it's nicer than I expected. They actually take... I'm guessing it's the seat of the motorcycle as the uh, base they're using to ride up and down. And they're actually using the motor from one of the bikes to pull it up and down. Way more high-tech than I expected. The problem, though, is, of course, uh, the fact they can't actually pose, you know, Zeno with Yoga or Zeno with Suka because that would likely end badly for all of them. And I do love their make reference to the uh, chicken, fox, and corn riddle. First heard this riddle back in, I think, like, third or fourth grade, if I remember the solution correctly. Uh, you first take the chicken from shore A to shore B, because it's the only thing you can take without something getting eaten. Go back, take the fox from shore A to shore B. Take the chicken from shore B to shore A. Take the corn from shore A to shore B. Go back to shore A, then take the chicken once again from shore A to shore B. And that's how you get everything across. It's funny, they actually make a reference to the solution uh, when Kawaku says she just come back down, you know, like them bringing the chicken back down. Anyway, at this point, Chelsea's a little bit confused about the fact that Hyoga murdered Tsukasa, especially given the fact that Tsukasa is, you know, standing right next to them. Uh, so it seems like they haven't actually had a time, I mean, they've been traveling for a few days, I feel like they should have, you know, read her in on everything that's been going on, the whole history of the Kingdom of Science and Senku's Awakening and all that, but they give her a quick rundown now in this graph that I absolutely freaking love. So in the battle team, we have Hyoga who managed to kill Tsukasa by, you know, stabbing him in the lung, essentially ensuring that he was gonna die. And Tsukasa, who killed Senku, you know, when he broke his neck. Long, long, long time ago. And then Senku repaid the favor by killing Tsukasa when, you know, he froze him. Uh, Taiju and Senku are lifelong buds, and Kohaku loves Tsuka, which... That feels like an interesting addition to add to this chart. I mean, everybody loves Tsuka. I guess, like, the, you know, 
just foreshadowing the fact that Kawako ends up saving Suka at the end of the chapter, but I don't know, that's just kind of weird to me. Though I should point out that it does seem like Kohaku, while she doesn't have an arrow of love pointing to Senku, her eyes are drawn to him. They aren't looking down at Suka, who she apparently loves, but instead they're looking towards Senku. I definitely think there's significance there. Anyway, then the crafting team, we have Zeno, who killed Senku. Remember when he uh, had Stanley shoot him not all that long ago? We have Luna, who's in love with Senku. Senku doesn't love Luna, sadly enough. And Carlos and Max, who are in love with Luna, because of course they are. Also, I just love the fact that Jen is dragged into the crafting team. <laughs> oh, because, you know, they don't always need his mental stability, so he's mostly just uh, helping with the crafts and the very long, monotonous labor that's involved with them. <laughs> oh, poor Jen. And after seeing all this, Chelsea basically says, A lot of killing going on here, don't you think? <laughs> oh, Chelsea, I love you. I freaking love you. Anyway, so the big problem here is the fact that Hyoga is the only one that can uh, ride with Zeno. I mean, I'd argue, I'd definitely argue they could make uh, Taiju and Zeno work. I mean, I mean, the limit is 160, they're 164. The chance of it actually breaking is very, very small. But again, Senku seems to show a vast level of trust in Hyoga here. He says, not a problem. So he's not even concerned about the fact that Hyoga, you know, might betray them, might make that deal with Zeno, or, or maybe he's already had this conversation with Hyoga. Maybe he's already aware that Zeno's going to attempt to make a deal with him, and he's talked to Hyoga about it, and they've already found some sort of countermeasure, some sort of plan to uh, trick Zeno if that happens. I'm curious. Anyway, I just freaking love the look on Katsuki and Chrome's face as they're riding across the ropeway. They're so freaking happy. And anyway, now I have to badmouth Carlos and Max for a second, because, you know, when Jen, Luna, and Dr. Chelsea are going cross, Luna is supporting Dr. Chelsea. She's holding her waist, making sure she doesn't fall off, even though they are roughly the same age. But when Carlos and Max go across with an 11-year-old girl who weighs 45 freaking pounds, who's so light that a harsh wind knocks her off, they don't even bother trying to support her whatsoever. Seriously, you both done messed up here, like really, really badly, and it's gonna take me a long time to forgive both of you. Anyway, though, thankfully, Koaku is a freaking goddess and is able to save Suka at the very last minute, using her freaking sword to dig into the mountains to hold her up. <gasps> oh, I love that. I love that. Such an anime move right there. And thankfully, Hyoga does not betray them and instead lands a helping hand. <laughs> I just love the sigh of relief Chrome gives out, like, wow, I really thought he was going to kill her there. I mean, like I said before, even if Hyoga is planning on betraying them now, it just does not seem like the smart time to do it. And then just Chelsea, oh my freaking god. Patting Hyoga on the back. Patting a freaking serial killer on the back and calling herself a Hyoga fan. Honestly, he seemed a little unnerved by that. He seemed a little unnerved to her before, too, when she first showed up. It almost seemed like he was hiding around the corner when she showed up. So maybe, I don't know, maybe she, like, reminds him of his sister or maybe... He's just afraid of girls or something. It, there definitely seems to be something up between him and her. I'm curious about that. Anyway, then Chelsea and Taiju make a great comment about how the Kingdom of Science is united as one team, showing Senku and Tsukusa back to back, side to side. Oh, this such, we even get the shot of them face to face like this. It's such an amazing shot. Just really shows how far they've come. Don't forget, I mean, we even emphasized this chapter. These two attempted to kill each other. They have killed each other. And yet now they're standing side to side. Now they're friends. Now they're allies. They just so freaking love it. Also, this is the first time we've seen Suksa since he was shot. He seems surprisingly okay. I mean, I mean, he's wearing the whole, you know, cape and cloak. So I can't really see his left arm at all. I mean, is it bandaged? Is it in a sling? I mean, what's going on with him? Is he okay after being shot? I'm just, it feels very intentional. that They haven't actually shown him the last couple of chapters. So and I'm just very, very curious about that. Anyway, thankfully, Chelsea was right, and they find that when they get over the mountains, the Amazon rainforest is still completely intact. Yay! And a lot of rivers, those are the Amazon River, they're gonna have to uh, build a raft and just sail down it all the way to the source of the petrification, though. Though I am kind of curious about that. I mean, they kept saying, you know, oh, when we get to the Amazon, we'll have such cover because, you know, they won't be able to see us through the trees, but it's not like they're gonna go through the woods to get to the source. They're gonna, you know, raft down the Amazon River, which seems as vulnerable, as open as you can get in the middle of a freaking rainforest. I guess if Ukiyo with his godlike hearing starts to hear the plane coming, they can just, you know, uh, hide in the woods, hide the raft until 
Stanley passes over them and then they can keep moving on. I mean, I mean, also, let's not forget the fact that Zeno blinked a Morse code message to Stanley, which was probably the coordinates, probably where they're going. So Stanley might not even need to, you know, track them down. He can just go in a straight line right towards the source of it all and wait for them there, lay a trap somehow, some way. Heck, you might even get the petrification beam before they do, which would be, you know, very, very bad, but... I don't know, but we still have Joel working on the petrication beam, trying to figure out how it works and all that, so maybe he'll find a way to counteract it, some way to stop it, some way to negate its abilities, and that's how Senku's gonna be able to counteract Stanley, counteract the petrication beam. I'm not sure, but let me think all that down below. Uh, what do you think about Tioka? Is he planning something? Does he have a deal with Zeno? And even if he does have a deal with Zeno, do you think he's gonna go through with it? Uh, do you think Chelsea's evil? I've been theorizing that for a while. Uh, now they're gonna build a raft. I'm assuming since they brought the motorcycles all this way, they're gonna board them on the raft too? I mean, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of purpose to bringing the motorcycles with them into the Amazon, into that dense, dense jungle. I don't know, maybe they'll leave a few behind and just bring, you know, one or two with them. Could see that happening. And just, what do you think's gonna happen next? Be sure to like and subscribe to this next video. Dr. Stone is off next week, but I have a few other videos in the works, a few different ideas I want to play around with and see what happens with them. I'm not sure which will be first, so uh, it'll be a surprise for both of us. But until then, peace.